Hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts and Dr. Daniel Barth here for the 52nd uh, program episode of How Do You Know? Uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a nice journey, uh, uh, Daniel. We've, we've learned a lot yeah. uh, through all of your, uh, you know, learned about the process of science, you know, and, and uh, you know, how to do science at home using simple materials, but also, you know, getting the critical thinking going about, uh, you know, how, what it means to be, you know, to actually practice science, you know. And um, uh, so now you're going, you're focusing on the subject of discovery, and I think you landed on a really good one. Uh, the discovery of Neptune, you know, so, uh, you know, Neptune was uh, the furthest known planet, uh, you know, before Pluto was discovered in 1930. And, uh, and, you know, just uh, within the last, I, I don't remember exactly which year it was that it got kind of recategorized as a dwarf planet, you know, um, you know, it was kind of like knocked out as being a planet at all. And now it's like, a, okay, now it's a dwarf planet. So there's a lot of controversy there too. You know, we get touchy about our planets, you know, so. We do. Uh, we do. And this is, uh, <clears throat> this is one of my, my favorites uh, from my many years of teaching astronomy is to tell students about the discovery of Neptune. Uh, it's a, it's a phenomenal story and it takes us into the heart of what does it mean to discover something? Uh, how does this process of science actually work? And we tend to teach that science is a kind of this mechanical lockstep robotic journey forward to an unlimited future. Um, no, the science is very much a human endeavor and, uh, we like that very much to emphasize that it is a human endeavor. And because it's a human endeavor, endeavor there are gray areas and disputes and people disagree. A um, couple things in the news just today. A uh, scientist from Canada claims he has discovered a new ozone hole over the tropics. And we've all heard about the ozone hole over the poles. And there's good reason for that because of the way the atmosphere swirls there. But everybody said, hmm, an ozone hole over the tropics. And uh, people in his own field are saying, nope, you're wrong. Just not maybe more data. They're saying, no, you're wrong. There's no ozone hole over the tropics. And this guy came back today and he's doubling down. He says, well, all my critics are wrong. All criticisms are incorrect, they're flawed, my study is perfect, and the hole is there, and I will be vindicated. Okay, and you might say, but who's right? Well, I can tell you who I think's right. I don't think this fellow is, but these are things, and I've we've come across this before, things where I say, folks, there's things I think are true. I may even be so strong as to say, I believe are true. And then there's a much smaller subset of things which I can prove are true. Uh, I think this fellow's wrong. I don't think there's an ozone hole over the tropics. Everything I know about the way atmospheres circulate says no. But does that mean that no? It doesn't mean that my intuition is on point. It doesn't mean that his intuition is wrong because I think negatively about it. We're going to have to wait and see. So we're going to get into Neptune in a minute. Before we do, uh, just a, uh, a quick plug. Uh, the Start Mentor book is out. Lots and lots and lots of waiting. This is a lovely step-by-step -step book with uh, something like, oh, 175 or 80 illustrations, many of which are in color, to help you with your new telescope or binocular. Many of us get started in astronomy and, oh, I've seen the moon, there's Saturn. Now what's next? There's a whole sky to explore. The book is divided up into what's visible by season and lessons that you can start from the simple and go to the more complex. It doesn't assume you know anything really about astronomy, but it's based on more than 40 years in the classroom 
uh, teaching people introductory astronomy and observational astronomy with small telescopes. There's nothing grand here. This is available on Amazon now. Some of us were worried last week because delivery times were really long, but now uh, Amazon is saying shipping in five to seven days. I've seen it cropping up in bookstores in Britain and other countries. So Springer is a worldwide company. And if you've ordered your copy, it should be there soon. And if you haven't ordered your copy yet, my goodness, let's go ahead and get that done today. And please, when you get the book and take a look through it and try it, I hope you will leave a good review for us on Amazon and other sites because that's so important. And thank you all for the audience who've supported me uh, through the writing of this book. And yes, I've already got the question, what's the next book? I've already started on it. Uh, I've sent in a proposal to Springer. Here's my next book. Uh, and the next book is going to focus on binoculars. So we'll see, and I'll let you know how that comes along. Thank you. Anyway, back to Neptune. So one of the fundamental issues that we deal with in astronomy and science in general, science teaching certainly, what's a discovery? We tend to have this mm, very pre-digested notion, uh, kind of a notion, almost the film version of events, that a discovery is a scientist who maybe labors for years and years or suddenly looks up and, Eureka, there it is. These kind of one-person miraculous discoveries, they do happen. Sometimes in science we do surveys. And in astronomy, you can understand that. You take your telescope and you say, gee, I wonder what's over there. And we point our telescope and we take a look and we carefully sweep and we're just looking for what is present. We're on a journey to find whatever we discover with the equipment we have. Sometimes it's a more focused event than that where a scientist has an idea. I think this is true. I'm going to plan an observation. I'm going to plan an experiment. I'm going to seek. The discovery of Pluto was like this. Uh, the Lowell Observatory and Lowell and Vesto Sleefer, they hired Clyde Tombaugh, and uh, they said, okay, kid, we think there's a, a ninth planet out there, and your job is going to be to look for it. And he said, how do you do that? And they said, well, figure it out. And Tombaugh invented many methods for photographing and looking for things like this. And how do you tell the difference between a comet, an asteroid, and a planet? Especially if it's very far out in the solar system, it would move very slowly. And there was math, and there was planning, and there was hypotheses. But ultimately, there was just a lot of searching. And uh, Pluto was eventually discovered by one person one observatory, this Clyde Tombaugh was on a mission and he was successful. It's not always that clean. It's not always that simple. There are times when a scientist has an idea and searches for the longest time and it's just not there. Uh, maybe the equipment isn't good enough. The idea, we've talked about this on the show before, is the Earth in the center of the solar system or is the Sun? Geocentric versus heliocentric. These two theories coexisted for two millennia. 2,000 years. People were talking about and arguing about, is the Sun in the center? Is the Earth in the center? And there were people on both sides of the debate. And for 2,000 years, the prevailing opinion was the Earth is in the center of our solar system, the whole cosmos, really. And... Other people, Galileo, Copernicus, Aristarchus of Samos, from ancient times through uh, the modern times, they were saying, well, we think it's really the Earth is a planet, the sun's in the center. The problem was no one could prove either hypothesis. And once Galileo invented the astronomical telescope and turned his telescope on the sky, he was able to gather data phases of Venus. And he said, ah, this data all fits this hypothesis, the sun-centered solar system, and it doesn't fit the earth-centered hypothesis. It contradicts the predictions that the earth-centered hypothesis makes. 
And that was a beautiful, clean bit of science. One person with a piece of equipment searching for a long time and then thinking about what they had seen. How do I interpret this? Many of us see, but we don't understand what we're looking at. Galileo himself, friends, he was the first person to ever see Neptune through a telescope. In fact, Neptune is visible to the naked eye if you have really nice skies. There have been many people who saw Neptune before its official discovery, but it just looked like another star. When Galileo saw it, he even noted that it moved, but he didn't make the leap that, ah, this could be a planet. So when we think about this, sometimes something we discover is lost and then discovered again. Halley's Comet. Why is it called Halley's Comet? Because Halley was the first one to see it? Oh, no. There's records of Halley's Comet that go back for hundreds of years before Halley and in many different cultures. The Chinese saw it. Indian astronomers saw it. Uh, Persian astronomers saw it. It had been seen many times. It was Edmund Halley who picked up that, ah, it comes back about every 76 years. And he said, well, if it really is the same comet, the last time we saw it was, and he made a prediction for when it would be seen again, he was correct. And he based his ideas on the gravitational theories of his friend Isaac Newton. And he discovered it's, all these observations are the same thing. It's one object. And today we call it Halley's Comet. But that comet was seen and then lost. We hear stories of minor planets. Oh, it was spotted. Well, did you find it again? No. Were you able to calculate its orbit? No. But it was here. Are you sure? Yes. Where is it now? Dunno. Notorious case of this is minor moons around Jupiter and Saturn. We knew of a handful of moons around Jupiter. Uh, and then we had the Voyager spacecraft launched in 1977. They flew by Jupiter and they said, wow, we're finding moons. The current moon count for Jupiter, it's approaching 90. And the great majority of these are very tiny objects. They're, some of them are less than a kilometer wide, literally tiny asteroids that have almost certainly been captured by Jupiter's gravitation. And how do you know it's the same? Well, if I see it and I say this should be its orbit, you should be able to calculate when it'll be around next time or where you can see it next. Sometimes these things like distant comets, asteroids, and moons, minor moons of planets, they're discovered and then they're lost. Hmm. Iapetus, the moon of Saturn, Cassini, found it, and he said, this is bizarre. I can find it on one side of Saturn, the western side, but not the eastern side. I can't see it. And he's like, ah, what's going on? He hypothesized, oh, the moon is half black and half white. Why would it do that? Okay. Because Saturn controls its orientation in space, and as it flies through space, the forward-facing hemisphere collects a lot more impacts and debris and darkens. The trailing face does not. And he said, ah, I'm obviously seeing it when I can see the bright hemisphere, and I'm failing to see it when I can see the dark hemisphere. It was 20, 25 years before Cassini had a big enough telescope where he captured Iapetus on the dark side of its orbit. So we look at those sort of things, and we say, well, if more than one person discovers it, who gets credit? Right. This is... Right. This is a very muddy issue, and sometimes uh, this is sorted out in a person's lifetime. Sometimes it's not. A lot of times, politics and national pride get mixed in. Uh, and, and personal pride, too. Personal pride. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. 
a lot of our very brilliant people are very possessive about their own work. I'm, I'm right. like that, certainly. And uh, yes, yeah, Scott, I discovered a, uh, a new meteor shower with my students in the year 2000. We discovered the Ursa Majorid meteor Amazing. shower. We were out yeah. looking at, yeah, out looking at the landed meteors mid-November, and we were charting them on paper because if you draw in the path of the meteors, you get this very lovely starburst pattern, and it all they all seem to come out of one point in the sky called the radiant. And we were out that night looking to discover the radiant of the Leonid meteor shower. And that was something we knew where it was supposed to be. We were seeing how close we could get, you know, a teacher and a bunch of high school kids out in the field out in Southern California. And we came up with, when we processed the data from 30 kids observing, we said, wow, there's two radiants here. And hmm. we found out it was a... Uh, it was a meteor shower from the comet Lanier, which completely disintegrated. And so the meteor shower happened that one year, and I haven't been able to find it since. Did you come back? So okay. Sometimes, was it a discovery? <clears throat> yes. Sure. Yes. Yep. And I found out that other people had predicted it but hadn't seen it. And we had data where we actually, we actually saw it. So there's a lot of luck. Well, let pride. me ask you a question. There's, there's, it's kind of a, that's sort of an accidental discovery, right? I mean, oh, yes, know, we were not. Right? And so it. if there are accidental discoveries, there are. Then what makes the difference between, because we, we attribute discovery sometimes to these accidents that you're talking about, okay? But in other situations, you got to be actually looking for something that's yes. predicted, right? You have to be looking and you have to be recording good data in an accurate fashion. Right. Those three but things you could are essential. just find it by accident and get the discovery. Right. Uh, what, who decides this? Who decides? Uh, <laughs> history decides, which sounds history. like a really eye-rolling thing, but um, who actually gets credit for the discovery historically? And the planet we're talking about tonight, Neptune, is a clear mm. case in point. People still argue. And if you go to astronomy reference sources, printed, published, and developed in different countries, you get different answers. Mm. You get different answers. So it's really, it's, it's kind of fascinating. And of course, um, nothing in astronomy occurs in isolation. And we love the history of astronomy and science on this program. And so we're going to back it up to the discovery of Uranus. Uh, if you're a sixth grade boy, maybe you say Uranus. I don't say that. I've been a science teacher for too long. So I use the Greek pronunciation all the time. Uh, and yes, I've heard all the jokes. So those of you in the chat giving, posting the jokes right now, I've heard them all. Uh, Herschel, William Herschel, discovered Uranus in March of 18, 1781. He was not looking for a new planet. He was surveying the sky. He was taking his telescope and slowly, methodically sweeping across areas of skies one night to the next, recording them, trying to refine our maps of the sky. He was particularly interested in double stars. And so he's surveying, trying to see, and he has a really nice telescope. He has a... Uh, a 24-inch reflector that was sponsored by King George III. And it's funny because both King George and William Herschel were German, <laughs> but the Germans were on the throne of England. Long convoluted story, not for this channel. But uh, <clears throat> King George gave a sum of money to Herschel to build a telescope and mount his observatory. And also part of his duties were to train the royal offspring and bring his telescope up uh, to Buckingham Palace and show the, uh, show the people in the king's court the wonders of the sky. He's out searching one night, and he sees something that's clearly not a star. Okay, how do you know if it's a star or it's not a star? Stars, because they are very distant, they are effectively pinpoints. We say, if you're out observing, stars twinkle, planets do not. Why? Because stars are a pinpoint source 
when the atmosphere shimmers, the point of origin of the light from the star tends to shimmer, and we say the stars twinkle. Uh, if there's a lot of twinkling in the sky, that also indicates the sky is turbulent. You're not going to have very good observing that night, certainly not for high power work. But planets don't twinkle because they're an extended object. They're not a point, they're a disk. And Herschel sees this disk-like object, and his first thought is, ooh, comet. In the 1700s and 1800s, the discovery of comets was the hot topic of the day. And Herschel thought, oh, it's a comet. And he kept back and coming to observe it night after night. He understood a couple of things. If it's a comet, it's going to be moving. The stars, the background stars, form a fixed background. They are so far distant that we as casual observers do not see any change in the pattern of the sky or the positions of the stars from night to night. It takes decades, even centuries, for us to notice anything like that. So this new object is moving. Ah, could be a comet. Comets move across the background of stars in the sky. And Herschel realizes it's not a comet because it's lacking some cometary features. Comets change in brightness. As they approach the sun, they get brighter. And as they recede from the sun, they get dimmer. <clears throat> we understand this today. The sun is vaporizing gases. <clears throat> and they're being ejected from the comet, and we can see them. And the comet's distance to us is changing pretty radically as a comet dives into the inner solar system. So we see substantive changes, and this object isn't doing this. It's not changing brightness. The third thing, of course, there's no tail. Now, Ooh. any one of these may or may not be definitive. I was out just a couple of nights ago searching for comet K2 pan stars. You may have heard about that in the news, and I was able to find comet K2 in a pair of 70 millimeter binoculars. It's fairly big as binoculars go, but it's nothing uh, as telescopes go. And I was able to spot K2. Wow, that's impressive. There it is. I couldn't see a tail at all. Right. Many comets, the tails are too faint uh, for us to see. <clears throat> so Herschel knew this, and he says, well, there's no tail today, but maybe as it gets closer to the sun, it'll get brighter. I'll see a tail. Nothing. It eventually, he realizes, ah, this thing is moving in the plane of the ecliptic, just like Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus. It's not changing brightness. The planets don't change brightness very much. Mars is an exception, and we can talk about that some other time. But most of the planets don't change brightness very much. They orbit in the ecliptic. They move relatively slowly. The farther out they are, the more slowly they moved. And he realizes this has to be a planet. And he announces this hypothesis. Herschel was a very modest and careful scientist. He said, I believe I've discovered a new planet. And he sent this information out, and he's asking other astronomers around the world to confirm his discovery. This is the proper thing that a scientist does. If you think you've observed a new planet, nebula, comet, you share the information. If you're the very first and you share the information, and if you're the first to share the information, if you're the first one to claim dibs, you can be credited. <clears throat> Sometimes you have to share comet hale Bop to astronomers. Hale and Bop. I know it's Alan Hale. I don't know. Is it Thomas Bop? Yes. It doesn't matter. Is it? Okay. Yes, it is. Good. So now they both, Mr. Hale Bob, they both right? found Hale Bop by accident. Okay. Right. Now the way that this worked out was is that uh, Alan Hale was using a telescope that actually did have a tracking drive, but he didn't turn it on. Okay. <laughs> Tom Bopp, 
uh, borrowed a car, a friend's car, because he didn't have a car at the time, borrowed a friend's telescope because he didn't have a telescope at the time or, or didn't have as big of a telescope as he wanted to use that night. So he, he borrows the car, borrows the telescope. They both go out. They're, you know, far apart. They don't even know each other, okay? No. And they both walk away from their telescope at roughly the same time. And guess what floats into the field of view? A giant comet. I don't know. There it is. <laughs> a giant comet floats into the field of view. Alan Hale knows what he's looking for because he had actually been out searching for comets. Tom Bach, it was just pure luck, okay? So they both, you know, Alan knows how to report a comet, so he does, you know. Uh, Tom Bob gets help from a friend who tells him how to report a comet to the I, to the International Astronomical Union. They their 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 uh, uh, discovery uh, reports come in roughly at the same time. So, becomes Hale Bob. I imagine Hale's Hale report came in first, and then Bob comes in right after that, and and then that's it. So. There One of go. the most amazing comets of, <clears throat> of that time. In fact, in, in my my memory, uh, is Hale Bob. It's super yes. bright. I could see it in the daytime. Yeah, I saw it from fantastic. downtown Taipei, Taiwan, you know, so it was really, really bright. There you go. Anyway, uh, so we, uh, we go back to the tale of Herschel. <clears throat> And many other people are looking for this. They confirm it. It's a big uproar. It's hard to imagine today the kind of uproar that this would have created in the scientific community. And it wasn't instantaneous. People are writing letters, which are delivered by, you know, by Pony. And uh, have you heard the news? This new planet, this is the first planet discovered in human history where someone knew what they were looking at. And there's Uranus. This is an artist's conception, friends. Uh, Uranus does have rings. All of our outer giant planets in our solar system have rings. And uh, current gravitational dynamics suggests that most planets above a certain mass and size should have rings in the normal progression of things. But uh, when we're looking at this, People found out that, oh, the new planet is 19 AU away. It's 19 times farther than the Earth from the sun. And its mm. orbit takes 84 years. This is really wonderful because, first of all, it confirms Newton's celestial dynamics, gravitational dynamics of orbits, because the motion of the planet Uranus its period of orbit all conform precisely to Isaac Newton's gravitational theory, which is a huge win. Keep in mind 1780, uh, Newton's theory of gravitation is a little more than a century old at this time. And so this is, it's still being tested and challenged. Uh, so not only that, but we look at this and people are saying, well, this is amazing. The problem is with an 84-year-old year-long orbit, it takes a long time. If you, if you wait 21 years, 21 years, you've seen only a quarter of the orbit. Uh, Pluto, which was discovered in 1930, we are coming up on the centenary of its discovery by Klein Tombaugh, and it will have in that century uh, gone around, what, about a third of an orbit? Because it's 248 year orbit. So, yeah. Yeah. So people are both overjoyed and frustrated because it's going to take a long time. Can we confirm Newton? Well, it seems to. But we need to get more data, which just means we need to be patient and wait. People around the world, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, famous French astronomer and mathematician, is one of the few people in the world at that time capable of doing 
the very high level math. You and I can do these sort of things with an app on a smartphone today. But mm. back then, it was loads of hand calculations with a slide rule and a pencil. And uh, Laplace is actually able to confirm. He says, yes, I'm quite certain the new planet proves Newton's theory. But as the years pass, Scott, they're like, wait, it's not exactly right. And you have to keep in mind, astronomers and mathematical astronomers, we are looking for alignment between math and theory. Not pretty close, not it's really good. Astronomers and mathematical uh, physicists of this kind are bothered by very small errors. Uh, famous example, we talk about Kepler and Tycho Brahe and Brahe looked at the orbit of Mars and measured its positions for 20 years. And compared to a circular orbit, which they all believed in at the time, Mars was off by eight minutes of arc. Eight minutes of arc, friends, is extremely tiny. Uh, take an entire degree, divide it into 60. Take a look at a... Uh, Take a look at the clock and take a look at what eight minutes is compared to the whole. And so it's a very small deviation. Most people would go, oh, yeah, it's really close. That's great. And they, they, we, we tend to ascribe error to ourselves. I set up my equipment wrong. Oh, there's some fundamental error in what I'm doing. My measurements aren't quite correct. But this is good enough. But for these observers who were extraordinarily precise about their equipment and their methods, right. they said, no, it should be right on the money. And the problem is that Uranus seems to be racking up more and more error. And how do you shove a whole... And there's, there's two options. Newton is wrong. Right. You want to talk about blasphemy? Newton is wrong. <laughs> you know, that's like one of those, uh, that meme where Batman slaps Robin. No, Newton cannot be wrong. So either Newton is wrong or... There's something out there in the dark that we haven't seen yet, which is actually tugging the planet. Well, maybe maybe a third Earth. one, a third one, because the slide rule was kind of freshly invented, you know. Uh, you know, I imagine that there were a lot of mathematicians that didn't even trust it, you know, so. Yes, a lot of, you're right. A lot of the work was literally by hand, pencil so that and paper. Was like, cheating to use a slide rule, right? So I don't know. <laughs> Some people thought so. Uh, so we look at this and most astronomers around the world said, Newton, wrong? Nah, can't happen. They, they didn't like that idea at all. Newton was such a tour de force. He came along and Newton said, let there be light. Uh, literally, after, when Newton released his discovery and was hailed for it, and the British were hailing him as the greatest scientist in history, the French, a good percentage of the French were upset because they thought Newton was like the second coming. He was a, he was a demigod. This is, this is some divine, this is like Moses stuff. You know, split the Red Sea and water from a stone and all of that. They thought this was just divine intervention. And they were, they were mad that the British weren't giving Newton enough divine credit. Uh, kind of crazy. But most scientists pretty much said, no, Newton is right. There's something else. Well, if there's something out there, how big is it? Where is it? How far away is it? And why haven't we seen it yet? If it's a planet big enough to tug Uranus, which was known to be many times the mass of the Earth. If it's that big and it can pull this gigantic thing, it can't be a tiny thing. It has to be something pretty darn big. Why haven't we seen it yet? Well, the answer is we had. Lots of people had. Galileo documented it. He didn't know what he was looking at. Hmm. And so... Nobody really wanted to say Newton was wrong. And so then the question is, 
can we use Newton's theories and mathematics and orbital dynamics to tell us where to look? Well, it turned out that there were, it was possible, but again, 1781, it isn't until 1821, 40 years later, half an orbit, that the first astronomical tables with calculated predictions for the positions of Uranus were finally published. So it took a lot of research, patience, because the data just doesn't come in quickly when you've got an 84-year-long orbit. Patience, accurate observation, scientists from around the world pooling their results, and finally, uh, this French fellow, Alexis Bouvard, and I'm probably, again, sorry, our French-speaking audience, if I'm massacring the name, my apologies. But he published this table of, here's where Urano should be, which allowed other scientists to examine where it actually was and document the differences. Well, now we get to our first player in this lovely drama, uh, John Couch Adams. And... Adams was born in 1819, so he was a two-year-old infant when these tables of Uranus came out. And he went to school to study mathematics. Not an astronomer. He's a mathematician. And he's interested, the big mathematical research topic of the day, Newtonian gravitational dynamics, which brings him into the sphere of astronomers at the uh, Cambridge University observatory where he's doing work as a calculator. He's a junior assistant, right? And uh, if we look up John Couch Adams, I looked, at it up, I looked him up in Encyclopedia Britannica online. Quote, John Couch Adams, British mathematician and astronomer. Notice the order in which they put those. Quote, one of two people who independently discovered the planet Neptune. And ah. that's a concession. For a long, long time, if you had any British resource at all, a book, a reference work produced in Great Britain, then the discovery of Neptune was by John Adams, who eventually became the Astronomer Royal. But when he discovered it, he wasn't that high and mighty. He was this junior fellow, and in 1841, he wrote down his plan, and he said, ooh, I'd like to study this problem. These were the niceties of science and mathematics in his era. I would like to study, and it's like, dude, who's stopping you? But you just didn't do that, right? You just didn't go off independent like Newton going off to the sheep farm to do gravity. It wasn't the done thing, and... He says, I would like to discover and investigate the orbit of Uranus when I finish my science degree in 1843. And so 1845 rolls around. He's now working at the Cambridge Observatory. He's not at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. He's at a university observatory. And he's there primarily as a mathematician. And he goes to the director fellow named James Chouse, and he says, ooh, look, look, look at the pretty shiny math. Look at all my calculations. I know where the new mysterious planet that's messing up the orbit of Uranus is located. And he hands his boss this sheaf of very dense, complex mathematics, differential and integral calculus, and all sorts of orbital calculations, Gaussian calculations, all sorts of crazy math. His boss, who is an astronomer, looks and says, yeah, sure, kid. And it just kind of gets filed in a box. Hmm. <laughs> and it wasn't until much later when they heard about the French claims that they said, wait, wait, our guy did that. And Adam's notes and things were taken out of the box and... Uh, he basically, he asked his boss, can I have some telescope time? No. Can you ask somebody else to look? It's right here. 
it's right here, and he was very specific. His prediction of the location of Neptune was substantially, like four or five times more accurate than the French fellows, who we'll talk about in a minute. And he basically was told, no, no telescope time for you, and no, I'm not going to have one of my assistants take time from their valuable work. And think of the Hubble telescope. You just don't say, oh, excuse me, may I use the Hubble? <laughs> no. Unless you swing a very big bat in the science community, uh, and you have to submit your proposals years in advance. And uh, it was much the same thing in the day. And telescopes were expensive. And they were rare. And they were made by hand, by instrument makers. No <laughs> nice uh, mass market products like Explore telescopes existed at that time. Had he had something like an Explore 114, he would have been able to go out and find it. But he didn't have any equipment, and nobody would let him play. Unlike Thomas Bopp, who borrowed a telescope from Pal, Adams knew no one who had a telescope, and his boss, who had control of the really nice toys at the observatory in Cambridge, wouldn't let him play. And so you have to remember, Adams is a mathematician. He's there to do calculating work. He's doing his research in mathematics. He eventually becomes a professor of mathematics. And they're like, what do you know? What do you know? Well, the calculations were pretty much ignored until later. And Adams himself was really sloppy about keeping up. He showed his boss and he wrote a letter, but he didn't keep up with it. He didn't say, hey, did you read my stuff? Did you read the math? Can I meet with you? Can I go over these with you? Can I show you I know what I'm doing? He just kind of, well, the boss said no, and he let it go. And again, modern people tend to fault him for this. But at the time, in British society, science society for Britain, this was a very stratified hierarchical group. And if the guy at the top said no, well, if you argued, you could, you could lose your job. You could lose your place. You might be booted out and lose your life's work. So he didn't argue. And the astronomer royal at the time, George Airy, those of you who know the idea of Airy disk looking at a reflector telescope, neither Airy nor Chalice made any attempt to find a new planet. They had, they had the goods before the French. They just didn't bother. Well, now we're going to change our story a little bit. And we're going to look at, surprise, it's not, it's a French mathematician. It's like, what? Mathematicians, they're cropping up all over the place. What's going on? Well, Urbain Jean Leverrier, uh, there he is, born in 1811. So he, like Adams, would have been a young boy when the first tables over Uranus came out. And he is a mathematician, primarily interested in Newtonian theory and gravitational dynamics. And he said, this is a fascinating problem, and I am a mathematician who's good enough to solve this. And he did. And his math was brilliant. His solution wasn't as accurate or as tight as Adam's solution for the location, but both, both locations overlapped. And Le Verrier works at the observatory in Paris, and he goes to his boss, and he says, ooh, look, shiny math, point your telescope here. And his boss says, bah. You're a calculator. You're a junior employee. What could you possibly know that I, the director of the Paris Observatory, know? You couldn't, and so I'm not going to look. Well, he doesn't stop there either. He's more persistent than Adams is. He sends his calculations to the French Royal Academy of Science, and they look at it, and they're not interested either. And you kind of, we kind of look back at this and we say, how could people just pass this up? Couldn't they have just checked the math? It's not that easy, kids. You're talking 
pages and pages and pages of calculus. This is work that took both Adams and Leverrier months. They had these positions predicted for Uranus. They had the actual observed predictions. And now we're going to use this data and do the math and find the location of something else. Months, months of work. And I'm talking 40 hours a week, crazy stuff. There's uh, the statue of Leverrier, and I believe that's at the original Paris Observatory in France. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, and he eventually became the, uh, the director of the Paris Observatory. So Leverrier, his boss has told him no. Like Adams, unlike Adams, he doesn't leave it there. He, had, he knows of another peer another student, a guy who's actually an astronomy student in Germany. And this fellow's name is Johann Galle, and they are age peers, and Galle is doing his undergraduate work in mathematics and astronomy <clears throat> at the observatory in Berlin. And he has, Leverrier has published, he says, I have this. I know where this is. And Golly writes to him and says, well, can you tell me where this new planet should be? I'd like to look for it. And the two men engage in correspondence by mail. And Leverrier gives his permission for Golly to look at his predicted spot for Neptune. Imagine that. That's not the way we do things today. How did I find comet Pansars K2? Well, it's all over the internet. Here's a chart. It's supposed to be here. And I went out on my back porch with binoculars, in part to see if I could spot it with binoculars, kind of a challenge to myself. And I, it took me about half hour of searching. There it is. I didn't write to anybody and say, may I look and see if I can see a comet in your predicted place? No. But such was the nature of science and society in, in the 1800s that uh, Leverrier says, yes, you have my permission. Please look and let me know your results. Well, Galle, unlike Leverrier, unlike Adams, has access to a telescope because he's doing astronomy research. And he goes out. He finds the new planet in about two hours of searching. So after all this back and forth and years of calculation, the actual search takes a couple of hours. And here, completely different from Herschel's discovery of Uranus. Herschel was simply surveying the sky, saying, what's here? Sweeping the sky and noting new things that he saw with a bigger, better telescope, recording their positions and documenting them. He's essentially on a journey like someone on a beach with a metal detector seeing what he can find, making a careful, methodical sweep of an area to see what he can find. Gali was doing something very different. He knew what he was looking for. He knew where it was supposed to be. It was simply, let's point my telescope and see if I can observe it. And indeed, September 23rd, 1846, Gale sees the new planet in a telescope and recognizes it as a planet for the very first time. Notice how I'm giving all these qualifiers here. Gale saw it, recognized it, and publishes his discovery. So my question is, who discovered Neptune? Hmm. Well, if you predict something, and I go look for it, and I see it, have I discovered it? You never saw it. This was the case of the Earth's majority meteor shower that I and my students discovered. People predicted it, but nobody was particularly looking for it. They thought the comet, frankly, would be too small to make a meteor shower. Or maybe the debris stream wouldn't hit the Earth, and it wouldn't make a meteor shower event at all. Nobody was really looking for it. We found it like Herschel did, by accident, surveying the sky, looking and recording what we saw, and... This emerges from the data the next day. Gali did something different. He actually went looking for it and said, there it is. 
and documented the position and its appearance and everything else. So is he the first one to discover it? If you go look at a German, a German astronomy source, yes. Johann Galle, who was eventually director of the observatory at Brelsau, professor of astronomy uh, in Germany's uh, university system, discovered Neptune. <laughs> the French? Oh, no. Le Verrier, because he made the prediction and told Galle where to look. And he submitted his work to the French Academy two days before Adams submitted his work to the Astronomer Royal. The British said, oh, well, Adams did his calculations more than a year before Le Verrier did. He just, they were in a drawer, but he had them. And so do all of them get credit? You heard Britannica, one of two people to discover the planet Neptune. What do you want to bet the German guy isn't, the, isn't on their list? But, uh, you know, it, it comes down, it makes a very muddy situation. And you say, gosh, hmm. who discovered this? And at that time, it was very important. When Herschel discovered Uranus, for the British scientific community, this was the equivalent of the first man on the moon. This was moonshot stuff. This was amazing. This is pride of nation, pride of scientific institution. <clears throat> there was a lot of, of nationalism involved. We did it first. That hasn't gone away. And so, you know, whose calculation was more accurate? Who saw it first? Who submitted their work first? And we call it Hail Bop because Hail's Discovery Telegram got there first, minutes before. But it's like twins, who's older? Well, uh, this kind of situation makes discovery a very messy process. Regardless, once the discovery process is made, everyone benefits. This is part of the nature of science. <clears throat> For years and years, the British and the French, uh, right up to the ambassadorial level, argued and raged, and there were nasty editorials in the newspaper about the French stealing our discovery, the German interloper with his telescope is nothing, uh, the English dog who's trying to claim the glory of France, and I mean, really vitriolic, nasty stuff. They would have been blocked on Twitter, I'm sure, <laughs> for their nasty <laughs> stuff. And they, you know, yeah, but science is kind of a sausage factory, even today. Yes, yes. Uh, it gets to be, and of course, who discovered it? Then the question is, who controls the patent, right? Thomas Edison. Many of his workers made discoveries. He owned all the patents. And even today, if you work for a major company like Westinghouse, Bell Labs, uh, oh, yeah. I work at the yeah, University of Arkansas. Their ideas. Right. As, yeah. a, as a science professor at the University of Arkansas, if I make a patentable discovery, the university owns that patent, ostensibly because I am working on their time, on their dime, using their equipment that they bought and paid for, facilities that they provided to me, so they own the discovery. If I discover something in my backyard with my own telescope, I own that. That's mine. <laughs> but these kind of things are not so clear-cut as they seem. The same thing, mm -hmm. Webb Telescope. Webb is looking at things. I'm sure if, you, if you're astronomy aware, you've seen things, uh, memes on the internet. Oh, here's what Hubble saw. Look how much more Webb sees. So if we look at a blurry image from Hubble, relatively speaking, and say, oh, look at that blob over there. And Webb sees it and says, oh, wow, it's a you know, planetary nebula. That's not a blob. So did the Hubble right. scientists discover it? Did the web scientists of scientific team discover it? Did the principal investigator who is planning that observation time on Hubble or Webb, did they discover it? Uh, the most extreme situation here, Scott, the Higgs boson, right? The Higgs was okay. big news in 2012. 
50 years of searching, we've discovered it. This is the particle that gives everything mass. Yeah, and the God particle, right? You know how many authors are on the discovery paper? No. 1,600. Wow. 1,000, over 1,600 authors are there on the discovery paper from CERN uh, telling about now there's a principal investigator. There's a handful of people like Professor Higgs himself who get pride of place, but discovery isn't... We rarely see someone like Darwin who goes out on a voyage of discovery. Bye, Mom and Dad. I'm hopping aboard this British ship, and I'll be gone for five years, and I'm going to discover stuff. And don't worry, Royal Academy of Sciences. <clears throat> I'll come back and bring you stuff later. And he's out there. He's the only scientist on the voyage. He's doing it himself. That, that doesn't happen much anymore. It, it does happen. Uh, Vera Rubin discovered the non-Keplerian uh, rotation of galaxies, and she is credited by many with the discovery of dark matter. Of course, nobody's seen dark matter yet. We don't know what it right. is. But she discovered it was okay. there, and she started so the, if, the big... If someone, if someone finds it, I mean, so holds it up, we get an image, like the image of the black hole, okay? And they say this is dark matter. Well, I have a, a good. I have a question. Who discovered black holes? Who is that attributed uh, to? I'm sure it's a well, whole story. You know, is it the person that Cygnus theorized black X1, hole? Yeah, Cygnus X one was the first one that was confirmed to be a black hole. But yeah. again, but this was suspected by many or? people. Yeah, it was suspected for decades. Kip Thorne and uh, Stephen Hawking had a bet that Cygnus X1 would be confirmed as a black hole. And uh, Hawking won because it was confirmed within a certain time period. Right. But again, who discovered black holes? <clears throat> the first image of a black hole was released uh, just about a year ago, wasn't it? I think the first right. image of a black hole. And it was, a, it was a big, big hullabaloo. So again, black holes were, we think they're there. We have a lot of math that says they're there. <clears throat> How do you image something that you can't see? Well, you image the things around it interacting with it. And this mm -hmm. is much the way with dark matter. This is exactly the logic that says Vera Rubin discovered dark matter because she discovered the evidence for its existence. But again, in science, many times, we see things and we say, aha, we interpret data, Scott. We get data in and we interpret it. Mm -hmm. Galileo saw and documented Neptune. He did not interpret the data correctly. There you go. Ur Urbain Le Verrier and Cou John Couch Adams predicted Neptune, but they didn't see it. Galileo was the first one to see it and know what he was looking at. So, you know, we know we know that there were many, many people who saw the people who saw Neptune before <laughs> Gali did were legion through millennia of history. People would have seen this. Did some of the ancient, you know, relatively ancient astronomers like Ulag Beg and what is now Baghdad, working back in about 1100, making some of the first star charts? Did he have it on there? You know, I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Uh, we know Tycho saw it. We know Galileo saw it. And, but it's a, you can see, or what was it Sherlock Holmes said? Watson, you see, but you don't observe. And unless we have the correct framework to understand what we're looking at, and Scott, this is exactly what we talk about with, uh, with things like the book Star Mentor, and I've said this as a teacher for years. You've heard me bang this drum forever. The more knowledge you bring to the eyepiece, the more value you take away from it. I, as an astronomy instructor, work on teaching people about astronomy so that when they go 
to the telescope or the binocular, they know what they're seeing and they take value away. You, Scott, have experienced this many, many times. You're at an outreach event. You have a nice telescope set up there. You're looking at the moon. You're looking at a globular cluster, a double star. Someone will come up and put their eye up to the eyepiece and then say, okay, Scott, what am I looking at? They want you to help them interpret what they see. If you right. have no context, if you have no knowledge, oh, it's a bunch of stars, I guess. I guess it's the moon. And after we've studied the moon, and we make models of the lunar surface out of clay, we make models of the moon uh, in phases, we take pictures of the moon, and then we go to the eyepiece. What are you seeing? Oh, is that dark spot Amaria? Are those craters? Oh, wait, is that a central mount in the middle of a large crater? And when they bring knowledge in, the discoveries come fast and furious. Sure. And people are fascinated and delighted. But all of these things are part of the discovery process. It's, it's like this chef in a kitchen. And this is the way I cook. I have a huge spice rack. Not all the bottles are labeled. And somebody comes in and says, can you give me the recipe? My wife laughs at them because they go, oh, I think it needs more cumin, more cayenne. Oh, uh, nope, I need some more coriander. Shake, shake, shake. How do you know how much? I smell it. I taste it. I have this I like decades it. of cooking I experience. Like <laughs> yep. Right, I have decades of cooking experience. I know what I like, and I know how to achieve the effects. But that's very different from someone who's a scientific person in the kitchen measures ingredients precisely, stir three times clockwise, once counterclockwise, pour it into a 9 by 17 pan that's at least uh, three inches deep but not deeper, and the oven must be at 372 degrees for one hour and 20 minutes. And you go, you see some of these recipes online, they're ridiculously precise. I don't, I don't cook like that. I don't explore like that in the kitchen. But mm -hmm. all my experience and knowledge, my background knowledge, informs what I do and see and how I interpret it. And scientists need this background information too. Because without mm. it, it's very difficult. Without a conceptual framework, a theoretical framework, it's very hard to understand what we're actually seeing. And this mm. issue, friends, as we watch what happens with Webb over the coming months and years, if you watch carefully and you dive a little deeper than the, you know, CNN news reports of what's happening, you dive a little deeper than that, you'll see a lot of these things. A lot of these same issues are going to be, it's just part of the ongoing bleeding edge messiness of science as it emerges from the data. Right. So there we go. Do we have time for some questions? I don't yeah. know if we're running we if we have any. First off, um, uh, Dan Higgins wants to correct everyone here that they spilled the Higgs boson wrong. It's Higgins boson. No, it's Higgs. It's named after him, Higgins. Dan yeah. Higgins. Is it, it's is a the joke. guy's name Higgins? I thought it was Bernard Higgs. It's a joke, huh? son. It's a joke. Oh, gosh, it's all over all right. the dictionary, Scott. No, I'm going to have to look it up. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I feel like I've been correct. Um, there was a conversation about intuition, scientists having intuition. Oh, I see. They were all there. Working, you know, so uh, Einstein thought that uh, intuition was a sacred gift. Okay. Yes. Right? Um, and he was really see. bloody good at it. Yeah, well, you know, once you've worked things through a lot, you know, then, yeah, you can have some uh, practice there. Um, yes. There was a good question about Neptune, uh, and I think it has to do with the likelihood of life being on some of the moons around uh, Neptune, but uh, I don't think that was... Uh, certainly doable. Um, it's feasible. We don't have the technology right now. The main problem is how far away it is. It's not the idea of a lander or life support or environmental suits. It's just, it's a stinking long trip to get there. Uh, 
Neptune mm -hmm. is what 30 AU away, which means unlike Mars, which side of the sun we're on makes very little difference. Uh, but a journey to Pluto, the New Horizon spacecraft took a decade to get to Pluto, and it wasn't the most direct route. It was the most fuel-efficient route. But even mm -hmm. if you were taking the most direct route, you're talking years of space travel in a small can with, you know, how many best friends do you have that you could spend a year cooped up in a... Yeah, you'll find out if your best friends are not. <laughs> yeah, think of yeah. the think of the fifth wheel camper. How many... Do you have two or three friends you could spend uh, five or six years minimum? Yeah, in a fifth wheel camper. <laughs> in a fifth wheel camper? Mm. Yeah, I don't right. Know. I don't... I don't... <clears throat> Scott, Science fiction movies always sure are like city-sized spacecraft, but yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. More questions here. People have lots of different uh, conversations on our shows, but... Um, they too, it's quite a lively chat audience. Yes. It's been fascinating to watch a lot of the people there have become friends over the 52 episodes where they greet each other. Oh Hi. yeah, absolutely. Like old friends meeting in a coffee shop downtown. It's great. Mm-hmm. I'm searching back through. Lots of kind of back and forth conversations with each other here. There was a, um, you know, a conversation about the imperial system versus metric system. And, metric. You know. Um, yes. Right. I try to use pretty much exclusively metric when I'm on the show. But being a Merkin, I sometimes slip. But being a science teacher for, uh, this is, I'm going to be starting my 46th year in the classroom in August. Um, wow. Yeah, I know. I remember when we were kids, I mean, they talked about the USA switching over completely to metric and that everything was going to go metric, yet we still oh, sell Powell. telescopes by the inches, <laughs> so, right? And everyone else around the world, you know, rolls their eyes at us, but, <clears throat> uh, and it's not which metric, which, which measurement system you use, do you use it? consistently, accurately, scientifically. And when you convert, do you convert it carefully? So, and right. in defense of the people saying, well, everybody else uses this. Uh, yeah, Copernicus said, the sun is in the center and virtually everyone around the world said you're wrong. So uh, science isn't about poles. And friends, every, I think I can say this. I don't often do absolutes. Every scientist, every professional scientist in the States uses the metric system from, from the time of their early schooling. And it is for them a native and they are fluent in it. So, yeah, just because we measure our gas in gallons and, you know, we go and buy uh, things by the pound and the ounce, uh, don't think that our science is backward. It's not. Right. It's just we have our own local customs that we like to stick to. Sure. And you Brits still buy your beer in pints, so no pointing fingers. <laughs> Pekka Hautala says the kilogram weight measurements measurement has has changed. Today they measure how much how many kilos is, to measure in kilos is its own science in itself. Oh yes. Oh yes. yes. And kilos aren't weight. That's the other thing that, you know, you know, Americans point their finger back and say, nah, um, kilos aren't weight, they're mass. They have weight in the metric system. It's called the Newton. And, uh, in the imperial system, we have mass. It's called a slug. 
And a slug is how much mass there is in 32 pounds. And that comes from the uh, constant of gravity, 32 feet per second squared in the imperial system. So a slug of mass is 32 pounds. And the same way, a kilogram weighs 2.2 pounds. And uh, you can multiply it out. Uh, but weight is force. Mass is how much matter is there. And uh, people around the world, they treat kilograms as weight. I would like to buy a half kilo of chocolate. I want three kilos of rice. Okay, fine. But it's not a weight. It's a mass. But they treat it as a weight and conversationally, colloquially refer to it as weight. How much does that weigh? Two kilos. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but I don't quibble. I buy my beer in pints and I don't quibble. And I let everybody and have their, their <laughs> local customs. And, you know, science is much more rigorous. Custom and conversation, uh, not so much. Right. All right. Okay. Well, let me All see. Right. I we are. don't think I have, uh, unless somebody has a last minute question here, I think that we're coming close to a wrap. I, you know, I, um, I particularly enjoyed reading your uh, study guide about uh, the discovery of Thank Neptune. You. And, um, you know, it, it just, uh, it made me take a little bit deeper dive into what does discovery mean? You know, so. And I'm hoping you know, people and, from and the audience discovery, will, are a download you can get from the Explore website. And I yeah. hope people will do that and use yeah. it to kind of as a springboard to launch your own thoughts and investigations and uh, maybe put something new and fun on your reading list. Yeah, here I'll post the link once again. Thank you. Yeah. And there we go. There well, we go. And, uh, uh, thanks, friends. Leave us a review for the book Star Mentor and uh, share. How do you know with your friends? Uh, if you see it on YouTube or Facebook, leave a review, post a comment. We love that. And I do, folks. I go back home, and within 24 hours, I watch each of these How Do You Know shows in their entirety, and I look through all the chat. Uh, so I respond to it, and I, I love it, and I appreciate uh, our thoughtful and engaged audience. It's really great. Thanks very much, Daniel. And to our audience, keep looking up. And uh, I will remind you that tomorrow is the 100th Global Star Party event, and it's going to be held in two parts. Part one is going to start about 3 o'clock in the afternoon central time. Uh, and in that first segment, which is going to last, I don't know, three hours or so, uh, you will, the, you know, all your favorites are going to be at the, uh, at the Global Star Party. But a special guest will be Dr. Seth Shostak, who is the principal astronomer for SETI. Uh, that's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, and uh, you know, those are the real scientists actually trying to find out, is there life out there? You know, so uh, he's a great uh, speaker, uh, quite humorous. And uh, I think you'll love uh, what he's going to bring up at uh, the 100th Global Star Party. That global star party will probably run well into after 10 p.m. Uh, because we've had we have so many speakers coming on. So uh, thanks for watching all of our programs, uh, and uh, we will see you tomorrow. Take care.
thank you so much for having perseverance and doing this and relaying all the information that everybody does every week. So thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to be a part. And as always, remember to keep imaging, keep educating, and clear skies. And we'll see you soon. Hello, everyone. It's Bob Fugate from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Congratulations to the Global Star Party on achieving 100 exciting episodes. Please keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.